I want to welcome everyone to uh, Energy Innovation 2011. I'm Rob Atkinson. I'm president of the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, and uh, we're really pleased to sponsor this this year with our with our partners. And uh, this is building on our last year's conference, which we also named Energy Innovation, but we changed it to 2010 last year. Uh, anybody? How many people were, happened to be at last year's conference? So a fair amount of people. Uh, great. So uh, I want to get started. First of all, um, I want to thank our, our sponsors, our co-sponsors and partners in making this a success. Um, first of all, the Breakthrough Institute, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center, Third Way, the Clean Air Task Force, the Clean Energy Group, World Resources Institute, New England Clean Energy Council, the Consortium for Science and Policy, Policy Outcomes. Uh, and also want to thank our, our supporters who really, without their support, couldn't, couldn't have made this uh, conference possible. Uh, Nathan Cummings Foundation, I don't know if Peter Teague is here or not yet, and uh, also the Lotus Foundation and uh, Rachel Pritzker. So we really appreciate their help. But also remind everybody, uh, we're not going to do audience questions with mics, but we'll have uh, note cards on the table. So during the panels, uh, if you want to ask a question, just fill out a card, hold it up. Folks will come by and, uh, and bring it up to the moderators. And also, if you want to tweet uh, today, it's uh, hashtag Energy Innovation 2000, any, in, uh, Energy Innovation 11. So let me just get started, make a few opening remarks, and then I'm going to turn it over uh, to uh, Arun Majundar, who, who is the head of RPE. So where are we with regard to energy innovation and clean energy? I think that's essentially where we are, uh, with the green curve being uh, the current state of cleaner energy on terms of cost and the red line the cost of fossil fuels and obviously this is a model but I think it's a pretty accurate model that describes where we are time on the bottom axis cost on the on the uh, vertical axis this is where we thought we were going to be about two years ago uh, this was kind of the dominant view of how to solve the problem put a price on carbon put a price on dirty fuels uh, that goes up over time and uh, eventually you'll see uh, this, this line of kind of natural evolution of clean energy will get below that new high price uh, and we'll be in good shape. The problem with that model, besides the fact that it's politically unrealistic, at least in our environment today, uh, is that there is still an economic cost to society from that. Even though the price is higher, uh, lower than carbon, uh, than, than dirty fuels, the cost is still higher. So it's this difference between price and cost, I think, that, that's critical. Um, so we've, I think, in some ways transitioned to a new approach, which is what you might call a subsidies approach. And that's largely focused on areas like uh, tax credits for production, like 48C, uh, different loan programs, which um, in my view are pretty uncontroversial about kind of giving loans to companies in the U.S. I don't think there's any political issue with that that I'm aware of. Uh, you know, kind of straightforward. Um, tax credits for homeowners to buy solar panels. Uh, states have various programs, feed-in tariffs and the like. And these all ultimately have the same goal in mind. Uh, to bring down the cost of clean energy through some kind of subsidy and, and, and also to move you down that curve. But again, the problem with that is that you still, unless you get the cost of clean energy low, the unsubsidized cost low, you're still imposing an economic cost on society. Second problem with that is that subsidies are not permanent, as we've seen in the UK where they're retracting many of their clean energy subsidies now. Uh, and third, um, the last I looked at, we're talking about global warming, not American warming. Uh, if we want to make this system work, we have to have technologies that will be deployed and adopted in every country of the world, regardless of their economic condition and regardless of whether they have a subsidy program or a tax or cost raising program like carbon taxes. Uh, so what do we need to do? We would argue, and this I think is the entire purpose of today's conference, this is what we need to be thinking about. We need to be thinking about how do we get both the price and the cost lower. In other words, the unsubsidized price uh, lower. And in doing that, to get a set of economic savings that are going to be important to growing our economy, but at the same time making sure that these technologies are adopted, are adopted uh, globally. Now how do we do that? I think there's a lot of different 
different ways to do that. Uh, we certainly need to be thinking about basic science. Uh, we need to be thinking about applied R&D, a lot of the work that RPE is doing. Uh, we need to be thinking about smart deployment. How do we get deployment in a way that doesn't just deploy existing technologies that may be mature, but deploys technology in a way that pulls innovation out. Uh, and one, uh, there's a lot of work in this area, but I will uh, commend a new book that just actually just came out quite recently by my colleague and friend David Hart and Richard Lester. Uh, David's at George Mason and now is in the White House for a year at OSTP and Richard is up at MIT. Uh, but this new book, Unlocking Energy Innovation, How America Can Build a Low-Cost, Low-Cost carbon energy system. Uh, is this an e-book too? All right. <laughs> so if you really want to save energy, don't buy the paper copy, buy the e-book copy. Uh, but I encourage you to t take a look at that. But in the last, just let me close by saying, I, I think a lot of the problem we face today is, is twofold. One is I don't think we have the right model. I think, I think we need to be thinking about this as the model. And the second is we have an awful lot of, I think, confusion in Washington as we see today about what's the appropriate role for government, what's basic science, what's applied, what's deployment. Uh, and we also have a lot of myths, I think, about uh, sort of what's happened in the federal government in the past. I was, I was joking that I think one of the things we should do is we should develop a software program program that uh, congressional staff and, and, and people in the administration can use and they can just put in their program and it, we can, it'll, it'll tell them whether it's an appropriate role for government or not. Uh, I think we'd make an enormous amount of money if we, if we could do that. Um, but clearly we need a set of principles by how we think about the role of government and where the right role for government is. Uh, historically we see a lot of, I, I think, misinterpretations about what the role of government has been. Uh, I would commend a recent uh, blog post by Michael Schellenberger at Breakthrough, uh, which is a response to, I think, a very misleading and misguided story in the Washington Post, uh, I think it was last week, on uh, the failure of government investment and innovation. And it was a, it was a story that was largely factually inaccurate and, and the entire premise was wrong. And as Michael has pointed out and other folks, uh, the government has played a key role in in clean energy technologies in the past, nuclear power, wind power, solar, uh, 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 natural gas. These are all technologies that have DOE and other parts of government have played a key role in helping to drive. So um, with that, uh, let me just quickly review the day. We're going to start off with a uh, uh, with a presentation uh, by Arun Majundar, who's head of RPE. We'll then move into uh, starting off with what is the case for innovation? Why should that be at the centerpiece of our clean energy and climate change efforts? Uh, we'll then talk about how do we actually get there? How do we get that line, that green line, below the red line? Uh, we'll hear from Senator Mark Udall at lunch to talk about what he is working on in the Senate and how the politics of this are shaping up. Uh, right after lunch, we'll hear a panel of how do we think about beyond the horizon technologies. A lot of our focus is on kind of technologies that are here today. A lot of things over the horizon that I think have huge implications. How do we think about supporting those? Um, we'll then hear a, a panel about how do we do this in an age of austerity. The, the days where we can put lots of money behind this with impunity are over. We need to think about smart ways to be able to support this. We'll then have a panel on uh, the role and implications of China being the largest clean energy investor now in the world. Uh, is that a good thing uh, for this movement or is it a problematic and troubling thing? We'll have an interesting debate and dialogue about that. And finally, we'll close uh, with, a, uh, with a short panel, a two-person panel, really having a dialogue between is there common ground or united front, if you will, between environmentalism and innovation, clean energy innovation? How do, how do these two camps that largely have not talked to one another uh, until quite recently, how can those two camps really work more closely together? to drive this movement, drive this agenda. Uh, so again, I want to thank uh, uh, my staff, in particular, particularly Matt Stepp and Matt Horahan for putting this together uh, and, and organizing it. And I'm going to introduce Arun right now and we'll jump right into the program. Uh, Arun Majunbar is the first director of RPE, uh, which is the country's only agency devoted to transformational energy R&D. He's been in that role since October 2009. Prior to that, he was the Associate Lab Director for Energy and Environment at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. He was also Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science and Engineering at UC Berkeley. In 2005, he was elected as a member of the National Academy of Engineering. 
uh, and at Berkeley Labs and UC Berkeley, he helped shape several strategic initiatives in the areas of energy efficiency, renewable energy, and energy storage. He received his BA in mechanical engine, BS in mechanical engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and his PhD from University of California. Uh, please join me in welcoming Arun. Great. Rob, thank you so much for organizing this meeting. Thanks to ITIF. And thanks for inviting me and getting me into, in front of this crowd as opposed to some others in Washington. <laughs> um, I'm going to be brief. I think it's 15 minutes. I'm going to say a little bit about what, what RPE is doing. But I think the context that, that Rob presented in terms of learning curves uh, that's going down a cost curve is essentially going down a learning curve. And I think if I take the message, we need to create some le new learning curves to, through innovation. And that's what RPE is called. That's how we define RPE, is can we, define, can we create new learning curves which are disruptive in the best sense of the word to what is business as usual. So let me just give you the context. Um, here are some challenges. Um, uh, many of you know this, but just uh, even at the sake of redundancy, we are importing about 50% of the oil that we use, and we're paying about a billion dollars a day. And we call that a national security problem, we call that an economic prosperity problem, because that's a large contribution to a trade deficit. But this is not just an American problem, and I think one should realize that. China used to be, um, in mid-90s, it became an, an oil importer, and it grew even faster. It is, it's importing about 50%, slightly more than 50% of its oil, and it's trying to figure out what to do in, to sustain its growing economy. Other growing economies, uh, India is an oil importer, uh, so is uh, Germany and Japan. So this is a global problem. People are looking for leadership in this, technological leadership, and trying to solve the problem. And whoever can do that will lead to their economic prosperity as well. So the question is, what do we do? And in the transportation sector, we have only one fuel. And that makes a lot of us vulnerable. Talking about the world, here's the population density in the world. And when we talk about energy, it's people using energy. And so where are the people? Well, we have, you can see where the United States, where the people are in the United States. But most of the population density and the population growth is going to be in places like China, Indonesia, India, Malaysia, etc. That's where the growth is going to be. That's where the markets are going to be. And this is where the, uh, the energy is being used. And what you find, if you put the lights on, <laughs> turn on the lights, you find that energy use and population do not correlate. And the United States is bright and we need to make it brighter in a sustainable way. But there are many parts of the world where people have not yet turned on the lights. And they want to turn on the lights because the income levels are going up. And they want to turn on the right kind of lights. And to enable them to turn on the right kind of lights that are affordable around the world is the biggest business opportunity of the 21st century. And you know, there's a Bloomberg report that says in the next 20 years, the total cumulative investment in clean energy is going to be about $7 trillion. The question is, are we going to stand on the sidelines and buy all that stuff? Or are you going to innovate and make it and sell it to the rest of the world? That's the battle. That's the fight that we have to, that's what we have to think about. And I think innovation is right at the core because speed really is of essence right now. There's a global competition. What do I mean by speed? The pace and scale of innovation. The only way I can explain that is to what happened in the last hundred years. The pace and scale of innovation, this is what happened, which transformed the whole world. And we cannot lead our lives, we cannot imagine our lives without these innovations. Electrification, airplanes, space, nuclear energy, transistor integrated circuits, fiber optic wireless communication. And all, all in fact, all of them, not, not almost, all of them happened in the United States. And we developed it out here, we nurtured it out here, and we sold it to the rest of the world and enabled the rest of the world. Imagine this happening in clean energy, not in 100 years, in the next 20 years because that's the window of opportunity we really have. So I'm going to show you a few things that we are doing at RPE. But while innovation in science and technology is necessary, 
as Rob pointed out, it's not sufficient. We need aligned innovation. I call this the alignment of four innovations. Science and technology, finance and markets. We need to innovate how to finance these things using public sector dollars, okay? How to create markets and create a demand for these innovative technologies here in the United States and align those demands with the global demand and then innovations in policy to enable align all these things as well as innovations in education. So those four alignments have to happen. RPE's role is to innovation science and technology by statute. So that's what I'm going to focus on. But this is just a necessary component. It's absolutely important to align the other ones as well. So let me show you what we're doing and hopefully with a little bit of humor because in this town it's necessary to have humor. So we created a program recently, we just started this, called Petro, Plants Engineered to Replace Oil. So these are Friday evening happy hour um, you know, acronyms that we create. But this, the, the, there's a message behind it, of course. This is about biofuels. So all biofuels today are photosynthetic biofuels. And what we do is we're using plants like corn, sugarcane, algae, uh, and um, cellulose to make, uh, to make oil. But it should not be forgotten that the conversion efficiency is less than 1%. There's a debate whether it's 0.2 or 0.5. <laughs> it's less than 1. Because of that, it's expensive. The cost curve of those, is, it's expensive, and it's going down a learning curve. And, you know, we, we're saying that how fast can we get there? In ARPA-E, we said that let's step back for a moment and ask the question, if plants were to be designed for oil, what would they look like? And how efficient can you actually get them? So this is the program, and there's some really crazy innovations that came in. I just want to share with you one of them. The idea was to use the metabolic pathway of making oil in algae. Algae has a very nice pathway to make long-chain hydrocarbon oil. The challenge is that algae becomes a little expensive because when you have an algae farm, it gets infected. There's water use. The photobioreactor is kind of expensive to make. So right now it is expensive. But the key role of algae is this metabolic pathway. So the question was, can you use the synthetic biology or take this metabolic pathway and feed it into a plant that grows very well and grows fast in bad soil? Because that would be an interesting. And that plant had to be tobacco. So this is a group in LBNL. Lawrence Berkeley Labs, which is trying to put the metabolic pathway in tobacco so that tobacco would grow oil directly. You would just squeeze the leaves and the oil would come out. That's the idea. And it's fascinating because if this works, imagine this, you would have big tobacco, big oil coming together and solving the world's problems. <laughs> I think that is innovation. <laughs> we'll see, I really hope this works. But we didn't stop there. We created a program called electrofuels. And the idea is to go, uh, go from, it's a crazy idea. People thought, this, you make electricity from fossil fuel. This is going from electricity to oil. And the idea is because we generate electricity out here in the United States. We, don't, we buy a little bit, but not much. And we can do that if the cost curves come down for wind and solar and hopefully nuclear. We can do that without the carbon emissions. Then the question is, can you turn that electricity into oil? And the idea is to use biology in a very different way. In this case, using non-photosynthetic microbes. There are a lot of biology with, which is not photosynthetic, and there are pathways out there that can fix carbon dioxide and directly produce oil. And, um, and so we thought, this. let's try this. And people thought, this is science fiction. This is going to be really hard to work. And in a couple of years, there's a group now at OPX Biotechnology, NC State, which created the first electrofuel. This is a biofuel without sunlight. And there's a group at MIT which is now producing small little flasks of oil. And there are 13 other groups trying to create oil from electricity. And uh, this is fascinating. I hope it works out. It's still early. We don't know whether all of them is going to scale. Hopefully one of them does it could form the foundation of an entirely new industry that does not exist today because no one makes oil from electricity. In the transportation sector, while we should make different ways of oil, that oil, if you put it in the global oil market, you're subject to the fluctuations and global oil price because it's a fungible quantity. We said, what is the other way of looking at transportation? 
There are two other vectors that I can see. One is natural gas. The price of natural gas has, has, has you know, split from oil. The other way is electrification. So today, as you know, the lithium-ion battery is an expensive battery, which is why the cost of uh, transportation or electric transportation is expensive. So we created a program called BEAST. And the idea is to go, this is batteries for electrical energy storage for transportation. And the idea is, to, let's go for that battery, instead of incrementally improving lithium-ion battery, which is absolutely critical, because that's an assured, you know, uh, you know uh, low risk path, we need to create some new learning curves. And the idea was, let's go for that battery that'll make the electric cars have a longer range or comparable range from Chicago to St. Louis, which is 300 miles, on one charge, and make it cheaper. Because that would then be disruptive in the best sense of the word. And so this, there's a whole competition going on. There's a, this is an example of a Polyplus, which is a startup company making a lithium air battery and actually making it work. And this is a fascinating example of how, what can happen if you put innovation. And this was an innovation in materials that put together in a device that is actually working now. And if there is about 12 groups that are competing right now, if one of them works out and it scales in manufacturing and reducing the cost, we hope, just like you have in, Intel inside in your computers, we hope you have a beast inside electric cars in the future. So talking about electricity, um, it, the electricity has to be delivered by our grid. And the grid is pretty aging. The average age of a transformer on the grid is about 42 years. That is two years more than its predicted lifetime. And all the transformers that we buy today, and transformers are absolutely critical because the high voltage electricity is running at about a few hundred kilovolts, and the electricity that you get in your, in your room is 110 kilovolts, 120 volts, not kilovolts. And so something has to, to change the voltage, and that's what transformers do. And they're absolutely integral part of our grid asset. And it's about a trillion dollars of asset on our grid, and half of that is beyond its lifetime. That's where we are today. So we said, maybe we can innovate. Here's what we do today. This is a substation transformer, which is about 10,000 pounds. It handles a few megawatts of electricity. And this is almost the same design that Nikola Tesla innovated in 1890s. Almost the same. And we said that maybe we could do better than that. So we invested, we created a program in power electronics. We invested in semiconductors like silicon carbide, gallium nitride, so that instead of running at 60 hertz, these transformers can run at 50 kilohertz. And if you do that, everything shrinks. And it becomes 100 pounds handling one megawatt of power. And this is what is going on. And they've actually demonstrated, they've got some results that demonstrated that looks very, very promising. And these transformers, if you make it 100 pounds, you can fit in a suitcase. You don't need a crane to install it. And that's the innovation that we're trying to do. And by the way, we are the biggest manufacturers of silicon carbide in the world. And that's our core competence out here. And the question is, can we leverage that and go into that direction? If you take these transformers, which are made of transistors, these are not only just lighter and cheaper and more reliable, they're smarter because they're transistors you can feed in signals and control. Then we ask the question, if you take these really you know, smart devices, single individual devices, and put it on the grid, what would the grid look like then? And that led to a program called Gini, a green electricity network integration. And the idea, we, uh, the question we, we were asking is that telephony went from wired lines to fiber optics, wireless, and as well as internet. The question is, what would tomorrow's grid look like if you put these smart devices? A lot of people think smart grid is the smart meters. That's just one end of the thing. The question is, can you make the whole system smarter? And the way electricity flows today is that if you turn on the light in your, in your home, the electricity is being supplied by some power generator somewhere, and you know, then it goes on the grid with absolutely no control. There's intermittent sources supply, there's base load, there's fast ramping start stop turbines, and it just goes all the way. It flows like water down a hill. You have no control of routing electricity on the grid. That's how the grid operates today. And we said that if you can make these, maybe you can make power like electric power routers. But if you start putting routers on it and start you know, turning electricity so that you can save an asset because it's getting old or there's a security risk out there, then the question is how do you create an optimal power flow for the grid? That mathematically, by the way, is what is called an NP-hard problem. It is extremely hard to solve it using what are called Turing machines, which are normal computers. 
So this is extremely hard problem. We said, let's attack that problem. And there are about 15 groups now trying to combine heuristics with cool algorithms to come up with what is what we say the grid operating system, which really does not exist today. And that is what is going on. So these are just a few glimpses of innovation that is we just starting right now. We'll hopefully see some successes a few years from now. And but as I said, this is just the necessary components. These things will have to scale. You need financing, you need markets, you need manufacturing of many of these technologies. And to discuss all that, how to align all this innovation, as some of you know, we have a summit every year. And the next summit is um, going to be in February 27th to 29th. And these are some of the speakers, and there are some panels. And we'll showcase all the technologies that we fund, and many other technologies we could not fund. We'll be inviting them as well and showcasing them. We just ran out of money for those. But we want them to succeed as well. And so this is what is going to go, go on next February, end of February. Let me end by saying that a few things. One is, this is real. This is not science fiction. Okay, this is happening right now. I'm absolutely sure that if you align all that, we can win the future. And you, what you just saw is a glimpse of the future. But let there be no illusion that speed is of essence right now. So let me just end with a quote. And this is a quote for a very different reason, very different times, Martin Luther King. We are now faced with the fact, my friends, that tomorrow is today. We are confronted with a fierce urgency of now. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, that, was, that was very inspiring. That was great. And uh, let me just ask you one question before we move on to the next panel. And that's, I, I think not everybody understands your model. And, and your model, I think, as you articulated, is to develop new curves. But the way you do that, though, I think is very interesting. You want to describe sort of how, how does the process work between when you open up a new competition or a new area between the time you start writing checks? Can you just give us a sense sure. of that process? Um, it's a long process. Um, well, let me just briefly say, first you recruit really talented people from the technical community into RPE. And then you empower them and hold them accountable. Okay. And the empowering is that they can spread their wings into new fields, identify a white space where they see innovation, either in the best sense of the word, the disruptive part, creating beyond lithium ion battery, or spaces where the grid operating system does not even exist. Like you open up that space, bring a workshop together. That's their goal, is to bring a workshop together where you have, the best workshops are where you have different communities that are relevant for that innovation that have not chatted before, that have not really interacted before. Once the feedback, once we get the feedback from that workshop, then there's a lot of internal debates. We call them constructive confrontation, using Andy Grove's words, that we actually debate each other whether this is worth doing. And so all the programs that we create come from workshops, but not all workshops lead to programs because sometimes we feel that's not good enough. Then we have a full proposal competition. It's open competition. Anyone can compete. And using that, there's some, we have a full review process. We send the reviews back to the PIs, the proposers, to have a rebuttal so they have some symmetry in the whole process. And then we make the decisions once we get the feedback from the proposals and the reviewers. And then we do contracting. And the contracting, hopefully, we can do it in about two to three months. That's the goal that we have. Then comes the main action, which is the active program management. It's not you get a check. <laughs> there are milestones you've got to reach. The PIs, who are the, one of some of the smartest in the field, go out twice or thrice a year to find out what's sitting in the lab, find out what is going on. And our goal is to help them and make them succeed because there are barriers all the time. If they do not succeed, if something is not working because not of any fault of the, of the researchers, the thing just doesn't work. We discontinue the project and put the money where it actually is. So that's the model. Yeah. You know, the, uh, our colleague Erica Fuchs at Carnegie Mellon recently wrote a wonderful report on DARPA 
And, and one of the points she has made, and other people have made this about DARPA too, is that DARPA's role is not just money, it, it's, it's doing two things that you also are doing. One is it's bringing together a community where, of people who may not be talking to one another, partly from different fields, but even within the same field. And the second, it's, it's to provide that help uh, later on right. and guidance. So I think that's exactly the, it's, uh, the model that's worked in, in DARPA, it's, it's the model you're using now. Right. It's, we, we actually, we took the best practices from across the federal agencies, and much of that from DARPA, but some of that from NIH. There are some things in NIH that I was funded by some of these people, so I could see what's the, what, what are the best practices around, and that's what we, we did. We just right. copied. Right. <laughs> uh, you just copied your model, but you're not copying your technology. Yeah, so, that's right. uh, so please join me in thanking Thank everyone. You. Wonderful work. We really appreciate it. And if I could ask the next panel to come on up.